Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck, and you're very well. Welcome to Friday Frat Works. And this week, we're going to take a look at my 2023 touring rig. Out tour at the moment with Cardinal Black here at the beautiful Islington Assembly Hall. Let's delve right in. So we are Guitar Corner, first in the chain, quite literally tonight. First two tracks going to be played on the most expensive guitar I've ever played. It's beautiful Squire 40th Anniversary Jazzmaster. All joking aside, it's an absolutely incredible guitar. Not with the usual caveats of for the money, it's just a great instrument. Might change the pickups out at some point, but more for a kind of love of just tinkering with things so much as anything. It doesn't need any alterations really. It stays in tune beautifully, looks cool, importantly, sounds great. It's just a very, very cool guitar, but um, putting a hell of a lot of use actually. Um, out of there, Megami Cables, of course did an episode on that relatively recently, so I won't bore you again, but it's pretty much Megami Cables throughout the rig now. Um, and I'm convinced, whether I've convinced myself or I am convinced, that it's sounding better as a result. In the rack, again a guitar that, uh, if you've been following Friday Fretworks, or myself or the band for any amount of time, you'll probably already know about, so I won't witter on about it too much. It's of course my Yamaha Custom Shop Revstar, very kindly made for me the guys at uh, the Yamaha Custom Shop in Calabasas back in 2020. It's just a great guitar, plays beautifully, sounds good. Uh, configuration, of course, got two P90s and a wrap over tailpiece, uh, master volume and a master tone. I was uh, quick to point that out. Obviously, that wasn't the case originally. I had two volume controls for being able to blend that middle position, but the reality wasn't quite as kind of practical as I would like for a second volume control down there. But um, it's a very cool guitar. Of course, the check in just becoming infinitely more pronounced the more I use it. Kind of bits of paint flecking off as well around the volume control where I put that to good use. So, um, just a very, very cool guitar, and it's nice to see it sort of aging commensurately with me, I guess. Probably slightly better than me, if anything. Um, next in the rack, we have a guitar that uh, my parents were kind enough to buy me for my 21st birthday. It's an MJT 52 Blackguard Relic. Um, very cool guitar. Unfortunately, not what it says on the headstock. Um, but 
did a video recently on the, uh, the 51 no cast that they had at ATB, which sort of reignited my love for a good blackguard, and that's precisely what this is. It's just a very, very cool blackguard. Uh, pickups are a mixture of bare knuckle in the bridge, I think, and radio shop in the neck. Uh, not much else to say on this, it's just a guitar that I've had for I think, 11 years, I guess, at this point. And uh, again, wasn't quite this beaten up when I got it. Put a fairly good use and uh, will continue to do so. Next in the rack, a guitar that probably isn't getting quite as much love on this tour as I'd kind of hoped it would, I guess. It's the, uh, the Shinichi Ubukata Gibson ES355, probably marginally more famous uh, for having been played by Dave Grohl in the Shame Shame Foo Fighters video. It's got the Trini Lopez style F holes, um, of course the 355 binding, which I guess te technically makes it a 355. Uh, Rose with fingerboard as opposed to ebony, rather interestingly for a custom kind of spec guitar. The reason I'm not using it probably as much as I would like is that um, it is for a track called On My Own. Uh, we actually released a live video of that the other day, which I shall link to in the video, but um, in isolation it's fine, but in the context of the set, that particular track is using the very tone on position two, which if you know anything about very tones, of course it sucks out mid-range, it sucks out level as well, crucially. It makes the guitar infinitely quieter, which just changes the way it interacts with pedals and amps. So it's a little bit of a nightmare for front of house getting that to kind of sit in the right place in the mix, especially within the context of the other guitars. So uh, I will work out a way for that to be used at some point, maybe a boost pedal or something. But um, in the meantime, it's just here looking pretty. Looking pretty, but also getting use is this. Now this is, again, a guitar you may well be familiar with. It's my Panucci 59 inspired. Uh, Les Paul, I guess, by any other name. Uh, 57 spec, I guess, so much as 59 with this. It's a 57 gold top. Uh, it's a great guitar, sounds beautiful, plays beautifully. It needs a restring actually before tonight's show, I've just noticed, but again, beautifully aged, and again, it's kind of uh, been dinged up quite nicely since I've got it. Just putting it through the rigors of the road, all of this kind of paint sort of uh, chipping off around the edges is me, primarily. It's an all gold model as well. Got the paint wearing off on the back of the neck. Very cool guitar. Angelo van Merienboer in the Netherlands is Panucci Guitars and makes a fine instrument. Lastly, um, kind of the backup for that guitar, I guess. And uh, after all the work it's had done recently, I just thought it'd be a nice uh, little jolly to take it out on the road, to be honest. It is my, not what it says in the headstock, but I can't be blamed for that. In this case, it was done before I got it. It's a 1980 Greco Super Reel. Um, again, fantastic guitar, and went quite a large amount of work recently by Mr. Ian Price. Recut off the neck profile, sprayed the back of the neck, re-repaired an existing neck break, um, and feathered that in with a bit of heavier lacquer up there. All sprayed. I think the back actually is as was, but um, it's just, again, a very cool Les Paul. Uh, sounds great, but crucially, I would be lying if I said that um, the way it looked wasn't a massive factor in my buying it. It's a beautiful mixture of grain and flame, that just depending on what angle you're looking at that, um, is vastly different each time. It's just a very, very cool guitar. And that is it for the guitars. Moving out of the guitars, down into the pedal boards, literally the first pedal in the chain, my trusty slash wah pedal. Very cool sounding wah. Take down tonight, we're on a wooden floor, so it's kind of uh, shifting around quite a bit. It's a little bit gainier than I would like, I would say, the wah pedal. It adds a definite kind of sort of honk in the mid range, which is cool for the track that we're using it for, a track called Jump In. It was recorded on that wah pedal, so it's nice to be able to recreate that exactly live, but there's a definite gain boost with it, so I might look to kind of modify that at some point if that is at all possible, I don't know, but um, yeah, it's just a very cool wah pedal. Out of the wah pedal, into Schmidt Array 450 board. First pedal in the chain, of course the Golden Fleece. Sadly missing this knob at the moment, but um, it's a bit of a set and forget kind of pedal anyway, so that's not too much drama. Out of the Golden Fleece, into the Gig Rig G2, that controls everything. It's just nice to kind of save the, uh, the tap dancing. It's weird looking down at me, isn't it? Um, save the tap dancing, but of course we've got all the pedals in those various loops there. So if we zoom in, We've got all the stuff underneath. We've got a Guru's Echo Sax. I'm to turn the level on that up a little bit earlier at sound check. We've got a small speaker overdrive by Great Eastern Effects. Black Box Overdrive 2 by Snaus Electric Company. And the Mythos Molnia, which every time I pronounce, I get the ridicule taken out of me. So uh, on top, Eper Booster for solos. Mua Trellicopter, conveniently set to the little uh, the green mark. Analog Man King of Tone, pretty much my main overdrive. I wish I could recommend more of a work a day overdrive at this point, because. They are a little bit of an and you probably spend a better part of five years waiting to get one. But um, if you sign up, I would say it's worth the wait. Don't pay silly prices on Revo, though, for God's sake. Echo Rec by Catlin Bread and the Korg Mini Pitch Black. HX Stomp XL, then from line six. Um, taking care of a lot of the kind of uh, modulation stuff. 
my very rudimentary understanding of Mini. We decided through a couple of different patches there on the HX stop. Primarily for, there's a general cardinal black one. As you can see, it says cardinal black on it. If we go on that screen anyway. Um, rise up, and I'm ready. Very cool pedal. And lastly, Jackson Audio Bloom Compressor as well, for on my own. A little bit of compression, a little bit of boost on that. Um, very cool pedal. Into the auxiliary board. Currently, this is a little bit of a kind of chop and change. The uh, pedal that was in that place recently was the Thorpe FX Deep Oggin. Beautiful, beautiful sounding chorus pedal, but um, needed a little bit more of a kind of prominent slap back delay, and that was the first to hand. Fortunately, it's a Starlight Echo Station by Universal Audio. As you can see from the flashing lights, set to a fairly quick slap back. Into the Boss RE202 Space Echo. Does a lot um, of which I don't really use much, to be honest. It's the first track in the set, it's a track called Terra Firma programmed into the kind of um, settings for that in terms of tempo and then use it as a ramp function and then lastly literally the last pedal in the chain the golden reverberator by ua audio again we've got the settings marked for that it's a fairly big cavernous room tonight so it's slightly less on the mix than it was yesterday but um it's always good to kind of test those things out of the pedal boards again magami cables into the big shot aby by radio um, it's passive, so it's not powered. Still does its job beautifully, though. Make sure everything's in phase. Make sure there's no ground hams or anything like that. Into the two amps, both of which date to 1968. One of which infinitely more original than the other, to be honest. On the left-hand side, a Pro Reverb, again dated to well, technically dated to 1969. Actually, there's one component in it which dates to I think the first week of January in '69. So I guess it is technically a '69, but it's drip edge. Um, drip edge referring to this kind of aluminium trim around it which sort of uh, marks it out as a particularly early silver silver face model. In regard to the settings we've got, uh, what are we on? About two and a half on the volume. Uh, it's not a massively loud stage here today but um, kind of feels nice between the two amps on stage. Two and a half on the volume, three and a half, three and a half, three and a half and then the tremolo is off. Uh, again we've got my cables running into the radio, running into the second amp. Both are on all the time, dual mono. It's a 1968 somewhat fictional brown face super reverb now of course if you know your friend the chronology or history you'll know that is an entirely fictional sort of fantasy amp that didn't exist someone at some point clearly gone to a hell of a lot of uh, effort and time and length to, to make this look like it is it's a custom faceplate presumably got a brown panel logo of course the grill cloth of course the tolex everything about this amp has been kind of played with save for its internals um with the exception of the transformer. Now I'm going to do a video on this amp because I guess it's a relatively interesting one but um, up until very recently actually it was in uh, Thunder Road Guitars in Seattle and prior to that I managed to track it back to Georgia where it was found in a warehouse having already been restored to some degree. It had its original transformer then, it's not its original transformer anymore. I don't know whether you can see down the back but we have just down there a step down uh, converting it from 110 to uh, 240 or whatever we're running here in the UK. But as I said, I'll do another video on this because it's uh, a pretty interesting story. Changed the speakers recently, they are Celestian G10s, I want to say. And one of its, uh, not original, but original when I got it anyway, uh, warehouse uh, speakers. Don't know what that is. That'll probably be changed for a G10 at some point as well. Plectrums, the usual. Dunlop 1.14, cheer slash, that's uh, entirely his influence growing up. And I think that's pretty much it in terms of gear, to be honest. There's probably not much more to talk about. As I said, we're here today at the absolutely stunning and beautiful Islington Assembly Hall. It's, um, I think we're about 40 tickets shy of a salad, which is just absolutely mind-boggling. So um, thank you very much to the people of London for coming and ramming this. Thank you very much to everyone who's turned up this tour so far. It's been kind of sellouts here, left, right and centre. It's just been an amazing time. We've got quite a lot of dates left as well. We're off to Holland next. So um, yeah, very excited. We've got the big old backdrop, which today, for the first time, having been kind of uh, swamping venues, looks like we've had a poster stamp up behind the stage, so that's cool. Uh, Tom Jenkins stuff here, big shout out to Tom, who's done an incredible job of supporting us throughout the tour. A couple of SGs and a little Pro Reverb, I think. Well, not Pro Reverb, uh, what are they called? Blues Juniors. Tweedy Blues Junior. Over to the far side of the stage, the stuff that nobody cares about, the bass rig. Which, given it Sam is filming this video, I'll probably uh, humour him at least for a couple of seconds. The Sam peg, of course, custom made. <laughs> <laughs> Not just a very green gaffer. Um, an SVT Classic running into a Fender 8x10 Neo uh, cab, which Sam, a couple of weeks ago, I was doing a clinic down at Absolute, Mu uh, Absolute Music down in Bournemouth, and had a phone call off Sam while I was in the car driving on the way down, going, 
don't suppose you go in near Bournemouth any one of these days. You was like, you know I am. Why? What do you want? I was like, well, it's an eight by ten Fender cab there. If you could kind of try and haggle a couple of quid off that, that'd be great. So fast forward a few hours, and that is in the back of my Ford C Max. Um, I think I did about three miles to the gallon on the way home. To be honest, back of the car dragging on the motorway all the way home. What are you using pedal wise, Sam? What we got? I don't half of them are mine. So. so I have stolen a lot of yours. Let me move the pen. <laughs> <laughs> That's the tone pen. Tone pen, very essential. So first of all, I've nicked the plasma pedal from Chris. I've also nicked the Cali compressor, which is the pedal show uh, yeah, version pedal as well. Number two, I think. But yeah, it's, a, it's an early one. Yeah. And I've got your power supply down there. <laughs> the vast majority of my pre-tone comes from the Aguilar Tone Hammer. Sands up there is a bit of a backup. And I just take a dirty feed out of the back of the SVT. And dirty I think feed, love a dirty feed. A dirty I mean. feed, can't beat the dirty feed. Um, there might be some pipeline jobs to mic up this wonderful cabinet, which fitted very beautifully in your car. <laughs> just but, about. Yeah. They're more for flavour than they are for more fun. tonescaping, but yeah. More for flavour than they are for fun. <laughs> Should be on a t-shirt. Um, I think that's pretty much all there is to mention, to be honest. There's some drum stuff as well. No idea. Ludwig. Look, I should know this. I've heard him say enough about it. It's a Vista light, I think. It's a vintage Vista light, which I do believe I'm right in saying is kind of bottom spec, or at least relatively close to it. Um, more microphones on there than I think they were on when we uh, recorded the album, to be honest. We've got the Roland something or other for a couple of samples. Um, stool, I don't know. Nobody knows, nobody cares today. I think the last thing I forgot to mention, actually, um, big shout out to Walt, our sound engineer. My amps are mic'd with SE, Voodoo, something or others. And if you kind of uh, shoot back around, you see they live in their own little houses. I think they are ribbon microphones. Walt was telling me about this earlier, and I wish I paid more attention. They're ribbon mics, so they kind of pick up front and back equally. Hence why they're in their little uh, radiators or whatever you want to call them. And uh, that is about the long and the short of it. I'm going to play you out now, but as ever, thank you very much. I'm Chris Buck. This is Friday Fretworks. Cheers to Sam for filming. I'll see you next week. Have a good one. Take care. See you soon.